Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to crime and entertainment. Now we have here a very special guest. Bob Edwards is coming on the show. Now I heard a podcast with him. He's got an extensive knowledge about the DB Cooper case. And I'm sure most of our listeners have probably heard about that. If you haven't go look up many of the hundreds of thousands of articles or YouTube shows that's out there, but it's been one that's kind of always fascinated me and Bob has a great deal of information on it. So I thought who better to bring on the show and kind of go over this because it's just been one of those things that's kind of been like right up there with the Jimmy Hoffa, you know, where is Jimmy Hoffa? Who was DB Cooper? So please welcome to the show, Bob Edwards. Bob, how you doing, my friend? Uh, Very well, Wade, and thank you very much for uh, inviting me on your show. Absolutely. I'm glad you could make it. Now, I guess before we get into DB, real quick, just kind of tell, you know, our audience members who you are, you know, a little bit about yourself, and then what drew you to this case in particular? Uh, okay, Wade. Well, uh, I'm a British uh, citizen, uh, born in Britain and uh, grew up many places in the world. Uh, I uh, was educated as a mathematician uh, in uh, Cambridge uh, and London, England. And um, I have been interested uh, all my life in aviation. And uh, I have uh, flown uh, uh, many kinds of uh, airplane. I have a private pilot's license. Um, and um, what drew me to the case of D.B. Cooper and Flight 305, I think, was both of those aspects of my life. Uh, firstly, as a pilot, uh, my lifelong interest in aviation drew me to this site, which is very much about aviation. Um, and secondly, my background as a mathematician, mm-hmm. uh, which drew me to the case because I felt that several aspects of the case uh, were amenable to a, a mathematical approach. Okay. Now, I mean, there's a lot of different ways we can go with this because, you know, this is a long time been, you know, dove into by so-called experts and, and other things. I think there was a documentary recently. It's one of those things now, kind of like the Zodiac. Everybody says their neighbor was D.B. Cooper or their grandfather was mm-hmm. D.B. Cooper. But let's go with, with you. What do you think happened and for the, well, maybe we just start at the beginning. For those that maybe aren't familiar with this case, really quick, kind of go through how this, you know, took place, and then what you think happens is your your best guess. Well, okay, wait. The uh, facts of the case, I think, are pretty well known, and as you say, uh, have been documented on in many books, in uh, television documentaries, in. Uh, movies, uh, some fictional and some uh, more docudrama. And there have been many uh, events uh, dedicated to D.B. Cooper. In fact, right now in Portland, Oregon, there is uh, the CooperCon going on. Oh, really? Yes, as we speak, there's a three-day conference in Portland, Oregon called CooperCon. Wow. Uh, So uh, it's a good... uh, timing wow yeah i did Uh, did not even realize that now isn't there a bar somewhere that's like there is the whole bar is dedicated to d it might be called dbs i don't know but i know there's a whole bar somewhere that's correct wade the bar is called victor 23 it's in uh i believe vancouver washington right uh and victor 23 is named after the uh flight corridor uh, where it's believed that Flight 305 uh, flew uh, on its way from Seattle, uh, Washington to Reno, Nevada on the night of November 24th, 1971. Okay. We can talk a lot more about uh, Victor 23 later on. Yeah, absolutely. So a guy gets on this plane and uh, didn't they get his name from the manifest? I think he wrote it as Dan B. Cooper. Uh, no, wait, that's not quite correct. Okay. Uh, he uh, came up to the ticket counter in Portland, Oregon, and he waited in the queue patiently until he got to the head of the queue, and he asked for uh, a one-way ticket uh, to Seattle. And in those days, there was no such thing as uh, online booking, and you never right. gave your name, and you didn't need a credit card. 
So when he got to the ticket counter, the uh, ticket agent asked him, uh, do you want economy or or uh, first? He said, I want uh, economy or coach, as they called it in those days. That was $20 even. He handed over a $20 bill and the ticket agent said, um, your name, sir? He said, Dan Cooper. Okay. And the ticket agent wrote that down, Dan Cooper, on the ticket, gave one coupon to the passenger and kept another for himself. Uh, the DB Cooper arose as a consequence of a miscommunication by a reporter uh, phoning in, I think, to his uh, office. And uh, he said, the guy is called uh, D. Cooper or B. Cooper. Uh, and the office heard D.B. Cooper. And that's how it passed into oh. legend. Okay, I knew there was something about like part of it wasn't accurate, but it was kind of a miscommunication, and that's where they they kind of sprung that into. But that's interesting there. That's uh, that's really, it's crazy how those things like that happen, and then it sticks. And for all these years, he's been known as DB Cooper when B really probably doesn't have anything to do with his name. <laughs> I think Wade is fair to say that his name was not Dan Cooper or any variation yeah. of Dan Cooper. Yeah, I, I don't think so either. I mean, uh, especially like you said in those days when you're not required to to give that accurate information. I mean, you'd have to be a fool to, to give your actual name or anything even close to it. That's correct. And I think the reason that DB Cooper stuck was that when the FBI realized this miscommunication had happened, they said, well, let's keep the name DB Cooper because that will serve as a filter to, to weed out those people making false claims or false confessions. Uh, because anybody who comes up and he says, my name is, is, D.B. Cooper, they'll know that that person uh, got it from from the uh, media. Mm -hmm. um, and that would enable them to distinguish the people. Whereas anybody who said, my name is Dan Cooper, OK, they start listening because that's the name that the passenger actually gave. Right. So that's how it stuck. And it stuck all these years. Yeah, all these years. So he's sitting there and then one of the the flight hands, does he originally pass a note and explain what he's doing? Is that how it goes down? Again, wait, that's correct. What happens is that uh, the plane is uh, taxiing out to the runway. It has not even got to the runway yet. And he's sitting in the far back seat in row 18, which is the final seat at the back. And uh, he's in seat uh, 18 E, which is the uh, middle seat of that row on the starboard or the right hand side he has that whole block of seats to himself and he turns over he turns to his left and uh, he passes this note to the what they called in those days the stewardess uh, who is sitting just right behind him in, in the um, in the jump seat and she again the legend is well known she thinks that he's uh, hidden on her and he just puts the note in her purse when he sees that she's not reading it, he turns around again. He says, Miss, I think you better read that note. And she reads it. And then, uh, the, as they say, the rest is history. Now, do you know exactly what that note said? Well, I only know what is written in the uh, FBI files. That note uh, was never uh, kept. He asked for it back later on, and they gave it back to him. Oh, OK. And so all we know is what the stewardess uh, remembered. And as she remembered, and this is what the FBI noted in their files, it said, Miss, I have a bomb, and I would like you to sit with me. Just that. Wow. In now neat that, letters. That's interesting that he asked for it back, because you, you can look at that a couple different ways and dissect it. You know, I don't know how prevalent you know matching up handwriting samples was back in those days but if you wrote it in some sort of off normal way just like just say big blocky letters that you couldn't really compare to a regular normal way you would write a letter then there wouldn't be any reason but the fact he asked for it back is kind of interesting to me yes he wrote the uh note in a black felt pen um he wrote Miss in capital letters, and he wrote the rest in um, uh, what they call cursive script, upper and lower. So yes, if he if he had allowed that note to uh, stay, 
uh, or to reach the FBI, then I think even in those days, they would have been able to do handwriting analysis on it. But he did indeed ask for it back. Okay. And not only that, he asked for other things back, which he had given them. Uh, he asked even for the matchbook, which he had been using to light his cigarettes. He wanted that back. So he was quite uh, meticulous about uh, not leaving evidence on the airplane. Yeah, it sounds like it. So at what point did they realize what he exactly was wanting? So, I mean, did she just sit with him after that? At some point she did have to relay the message because I know there was a, a ransom demand. And I think to some extent when they made their landing, most of the passengers got off and maybe some of the crew. I don't know if I have that right or not. Well, in fact, uh, the um, the demand for the ransom came quite quickly, but it came in a kind of uh, complicated way uh, because the, the personalities changed around. The stewardess who first received this note was so shocked that she really was not able to react. And according to some accounts, and there's a little bit of difference, she dropped the note on the floor. And then the, the, the third stewardess came back, the junior stewardess came back. She saw this lady uh, kind of open mouth and, and it seems like she saw the note on the floor and picked it up. And it's at that point, it seems like the junior stewardess, that was the youngest uh, of the three cabin crew, um, picked up that ball and, and, and ran with it, if you like. Um, she, I believe, uh, took the note. In fact, here the, the testimonies are, are a little bit indistinct. Um, whether she took the note or the other stewardess took the note to the flight deck, I don't know. But quickly the flight deck became informed that there was a hijacker on board and he was asking for $200,000 in four parachutes. That was the essence of his demand. 200,000 and four parachutes. Now, what do you think the reason for the four parachutes was being that he's only one guy? Um, well, I think that, um, the, the, uh, later conclusion of the FBI and certainly the immediate conclusion of the flight crew was that, uh, these four parachutes are a form of protection for himself that he may uh, use one of them and he may demand for some of the crew members to jump with him using some of the others. And therefore it's a kind of a hostage situation uh -huh. uh, where um, he wants to be sure nobody is going to mess with the parachutes and risk that uh, one of the crew depart with him. Uh, that's one possibility. And that seems very plausible to me, of course, we can never really know what right. happened, but uh, the other possibility is that um, he never intended to make a hostage out of the crew, but what he wanted to be sure was that none of the parachutes was tampered with. So even if he jumped alone, um, they they uh, would not know which uh, parachute he chose. Right. Yeah, so that's it's like, it's... perfect sense now that I sit here and think about it. Cause like, if you just ask for one parachute, obviously they know you're going to be the one that's probably going to attempt to make this jump. So, you know, they could give you a faulty one or one that wouldn't open or, you know, whatever the case may be. But the, the fact that you're wanting four people on the ground may not realize, well, maybe other people on the flight are possibly in on it. Maybe he will make some of the crew jump to possibly have you know, like you said, a hostage situation on the ground. So you can't take that risk as yeah. uh, you may put that shoot on someone else. And then it doesn't open that you basically, you know, give that person the death sentence. So that, that makes perfect sense. I don't know. Think about it. Yeah, that is, that was the conclusion, the immediate conclusion of the flight crew. And for that reason, they made a very uh, fast decision to, to uh, accept his demands. Mm -hmm. And, uh, from the get-go, uh, they agreed that they would uh, do this. They conveyed this, uh, these demands to the uh, uh, to their company. And don't don't forget, we're in the air at this time. We're we're between uh, Portland and Seattle, 
So they uh, radio ahead and they say, we need to define $200,000 in four parachutes by the time we land. If you don't have them ready, we're going to have to circle until you have them, which is what happened. And they did have to circle a little bit till they could round it up? Not a little bit. They had to circle for over an hour. Oh, wow. The flight should have, should have taken 35 minutes. It took uh, well over an hour and a half while they got the money from a bank. And while they got four parachutes, which uh, were a little bit difficult to get. First of all, they tried to get parachutes from McCord Air Force Base, and they could not do that. And in the end, they got the parachutes from a civilian a skydiving company. And that took a bit of a while. The, the hijacker got uh, a little bit upset uh, about the delay. But um, short story is that they circled over uh, Seattle and Tacoma, Washington, in a racetrack pattern for well over an hour. And meanwhile, the crew were telling the passengers, well, we have a mechanical problem. Don't worry, we're going to circle, have a drink. They serve drinks. And once everything was ready on the ground in Seattle, then they went ahead and landed. Okay. Now, the whoever, I'm assuming this is the FBI that's, that's helping round this money up? Uh, no, the FBI did not have a hand in collecting the money. Northwest did that on their own. Okay, well... Um, were the bills documented or are the serial numbers written down of the money? Yes, yes. Every uh, every one of those uh, $10,020 bills was uh, microfilmed. And so every serial number was recorded. Okay. Uh, and that'll come into yeah. play a little bit later on in the story, but I wanted to make sure that I was correct that they did document every one of those bills. That's correct, yes. Okay. So they finally make their landing and the crew is a, not the crew, but, um, the, the other passengers on this plane, they're oblivious that any of this is going on. They have no clue. This is the beauty uh, from the hijackers point of view of the whole episode. There was not one single passenger between Portland and Seattle who knew that they had been hijacked. And when they all got off the plane, thinking that it had just been mechanical difficulties, and they were met by FBI agents. At that point, they knew they'd been hijacked. Wow. So uh, it really worked well. If that's what the hijacker planned, he, it really worked the way he planned. Now, even all these years going over this with you, you, you just kind of think about it and it gets fresh in your mind. This guy was a smart cat. I mean, he had it together. He had things planned out. Now, granted, we can make the best of plans. It don't always mean it's going to go that way. But, I mean, he, he had it mapped out pretty well. And I'm assuming a lot of this had to be thought out. How many crew members stayed on the plane once they landed and he got his money in his parachutes? Okay, what happened was that he uh, allowed all the passengers to leave. Uh, so that's 35 passengers, excluding himself, of course. Right. Uh, he wanted the three flight crew to stay on the flight deck, which they did. And obviously they had not seen him and they did not see him, and they would never see him. And of the three cabin crew, he allowed two of the stewardesses to get off, that's to say the senior and the second stewardess, uh, and he kept back the junior stewardess, the youngest of the three, who had been sitting with him next to him on, on row 18 throughout that whole flight. And obviously he had come to feel that this little girl, I, I'm, I want to keep her because she's going to be my intermediary mm -hmm. uh, she's done a very good job so far so i want her to stay on board and uh, whatever else i may want she's going to be the one who goes to the crew and tells them what it is so uh there's the hijacker the three flight crew and one stewardess still on the plane when they turn it around and start going back south okay now once they're in the air, he's got a very specific set of instructions of where they're heading, how far or how high rather they need to go, what altitude to maintain. And then there's a key piece of this story that you, you spoke about in another podcast that I heard mm -hmm. about this particular model airplane being able to stay flying while also letting these stairs go down in the back. And it was one of the only models I believe that, that done this kind of walk us through that aspect of it real quick. Uh, okay. Wade. in those days in the USA, 
uh, there were three models of airplane which had what they called the ventral air stair, which is the stair underneath the tail, which can be lowered and is normally used for embarking and disembarking the passengers. And those three airplanes were uh, the Boeing 727, which is this particular model we're talking about, also the Douglas DC-9, and there was also a British airplane called the BAC-111. All three of these airplanes had uh, an air stair which dropped down out of the tail. Uh, so, in principle, uh, all of these three airplanes would have been suitable for the hijacker. However, there's one important point which distinguishes the 727 from the other two, from the DC-9 and from the 111. That's to say that the 727 had actually been tested by the Boeing company with the air stairs down in flight and had been proved to be stable and to be controllable in that configuration. And um, that was done by the Boeing airplane company in uh, 1963 and 1964 um, out of Boeing Field in Washington. And those uh, tests had been documented. And, and obviously we can conjecture, if you like, that the hijacker may have known about those tests. And if he did, that obviously creates some narratives which we can explore. But uh, yes, Wade, to answer your question, um, the Boeing 727 not only could lower the air stairs in flight, but it had been tested in doing so. And, uh, was completely controllable and um, was safe to fly. Wow. And I mean, and that's interesting because those tests that were done, I mean, I'm assuming that the, your Joe public, your average guy is not going to know about those. So he would have either had to know someone maybe within Boeing or been, I would think been a part of it or some, some way, shape, form or fashion. He had to find out that that was controllable because that uh, that's not just luck that you choose that flight that has that capability of that stairwell, being able to go down and the flight still be maintained. I mean, nobody's that lucky. And with mm -hmm. all of the planning that it seems like he's put into this, it doesn't seem like he just made a, a guess that that part was going to work. So I would think he had to some way have knowledge that, that that was actually, like you said, that's the important part. It was actually tested. So it's not like, well, we think it can, or, you know, it probably mm -hmm. could. We know it will. That's a, that's a huge difference. That's correct, Wade. And uh, the number of people in the Boeing airplane company who were directly involved in those tests was about 30, uh, including the pilots uh, and the ground uh, engineers. And needless to say, the FBI went after all of those guys. Right. So uh, that was one of the first places they looked. They called up the Boeing company and they said, we need to interview every one of these guys. And they made files on every one of them. Well, they went through all of them. And the, some of these guys were uh, way too old to be the hijacker, like they were in their 60s. Right. Um, some of them, um, had the wrong uh, height or weight or appearance. And uh, I presume, although I don't know for sure, but I presume that some of them had a perfect alibi. They could say on that day, I was somewhere else and I, I can right. prove it. So long story short, the FBI went through all of those guys and they eliminated every one of them. So to the FBI satisfaction, it was not a member of the immediate Boeing team who participated in those tests. However, Boeing was at, even at that time a gigantic company and there would be other people who knew about those tests or who read the reports or who were simply uh, employed at Boeing Field um, and saw the airplane department come back. So um, there could have been, I would say, hundreds of Boeing employees or even friends or relatives or acquaintances of Boeing employees, somebody who talked to a Boeing guy in a bar mm -hmm. who knew this thing happened. Yeah. That's the thing is it's, it's really hard to pinpoint because as you said, if one of those guys happens to, 
you know, go, they could be talking amongst themselves at a bar and somebody sitting, you know, a seat down over here, this conversation I've been in bars many a times and depending <laughs> on the tone of, of people's conversation, I almost feel like I'm in the middle of it, whether I know them or not, because they're talking so loud, you know, you can't help but to, to overhear it. So there's really, obviously, obviously they made, I think the right choice of going and investigating all those guys who they knew was directly involved. But as you said, you know, you start weeding out, okay, this one's way too old. This one's way too short. This one's way too heavy. You you start yeah. to kind of think at that point, then, well, the possibilities almost kind of become endless after that, because if this was talked about, you know, outside in the free world with anybody, be it family member, cousin, in law, yeah. I mean, it's, it becomes an uncontrollable thing to try to track down at that point. Yes, it, it, they really drew a blank and they really could not take that any further because the Boeing company obviously was not happy about this investigation at all. They felt a little bit uh, invaded mm -hmm. uh, to have the FBI even suspect there are people are doing this kind of thing. And they wrote, and it's written in the files, the Boeing uh, company um, was very adamant that this is not the sort of thing a Boeing uh, pilot or engineer would even dream about. Right. So they could only really interview the the immediate uh, uh, members of the flight tests, and really that was that. However, they did. Um, there were a number of other areas where they um, uh, looked for an aviation connection. Um, one of them is one which I myself looked at, and and we can come back to that later. But that's the CIA connection. Uh, because uh, there was another series of tests that was done in uh, Southeast Asia in Thailand by the CIA. And again, it involved people jumping out of the back of the 727. And that's a whole other story on which I wrote a whole chapter in my book. Wow. Okay. Yeah. And that's an area which the FBI uh, did not pursue. And I believe could not pursue because the FBI and the CIA could not talk to each other in those days. Really? They couldn't? I didn't know that. That's correct. I recently spoke on the telephone to a former um, lead agent of what they called the Norjack case. Uh, as they called it in those days, Norjack stood for Northwest Hijack. Right. He was the lead agent uh, from about 2008 to 2010. Already the case was pretty much cold. But he was uh, a young and upcoming agent in those days, and he was really interested in the case. He pursued it for a couple of years, uh, didn't get anywhere, and now he's retired. He retired, in fact, this year. And I called him up and I said, um, um, did you ever think about talking to the people in the CIA or the CIA front companies who had done this testing in Thailand? And he said to me, Bob, we couldn't do that. The CIA would not talk to us. There is no way we could have interviewed a CIA person or even a person working for a CIA front company. They would have just pulled down the shades on us. So that was a whole other area of um, um, leads or people who would have known that this kind of jump could be done. And that's uh, another story in itself. I did talk to one of the guys who did those jumps in Thailand. Uh, these guys were young guys called uh, smoke jumpers. You maybe heard the term smoke yeah, jumper. Yeah, I've heard that term before used, yeah. Okay, smoke jumper, as you probably know, were guys, and they were nearly always very young guys who worked for the U.S. Forest Service, typically up in the Pacific Northwest, and their job was to jump out of airplanes and fight forest fires. Mm -hmm. And the short story in, in Thailand is that there were about seven or eight of these guys working in Vientiane, Laos, doing some covert stuff uh, for the CIA. Um, and uh, somebody called him up and said, we'd like you to come over to Thailand and do some jumps out of a 727 jet airplane, which I think would have been very interesting for them. They certainly would have never had done such a jump before. And furthermore, they said, and this is basically a plan where if this goes well, we're going to do the same thing over in Tibet. And we're going to do jumps and airdrops in Tibet to uh, supply the rebels fighting the Chinese communists. 
So that was an exciting project. And you can imagine these young guys, they liked that idea. Well, this uh, old, uh, old uh, I won't say old, but a retired smoke jumper, he told me his story. And he said, yeah, we did, a, uh, me and my mates, we, we, uh, we did jump out of a 727. And um, it went perfectly well. The jump was extremely benign. I had no problem with the jump whatsoever. In fact, it was an easier jump even than jumping out of a, a propeller plane because you don't get the blast from the prop. And we were, would have been very glad to do it again. But they canceled the Tibet project so that we did that once and once only. And that was that. Wow. So long story short, there was a whole other group of guys who knew you could jump out of a 727 quite safely. Um, and those were guys working for um, Air America and uh, Southern Air Transport, which were front companies for the CIA. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so a whole other avenue of suspects that they couldn't even talk to. They couldn't even begin. They couldn't. No, they could not talk to those guys. However, they did uh, pursue smoke jumpers. <clears throat> and uh, the gentleman whom I talked to said, yeah, the FBI did come after me. I was running a bar in Anchorage, uh, Alaska. And one day, two FBI suits walk in and they say, um, where were you on November 24th, 1971? He said, well, gentlemen, I was right here in Anchorage, Alaska, and I can prove it. So uh, I wish you a good day. <laughs> so, yeah, they pursued some smoke jumpers, but didn't get anywhere. Now, what exactly he did give uh, directions uh, getting back to the point to where they're in the air with the money, he did give directions on altitude to stay and a direction to head. Now I'm assuming, obviously, as we've kind of talked over, a lot of this stuff was pre-planned. Where in your estimation, obviously, I'm assuming the altitude was to not pop up on radars, or that's my guess. Uh, uh, no, I would say, Wade, it was something different altogether. Really? Okay. Um, the the uh, hijacker gave some very um, explicit instructions, and he gave three instructions. He said, first of all, um, I want you to stay at 10,000 feet. Right. That was not to uh, avoid radar, because at 10,000 feet, you're still visible on radar. Second thing he said was, uh, I want the uh, flaps at 15 degrees. Now, not many people outside the avian industry, even though aviation industry, uh, even know what flaps are. Uh, but flaps are basically control surfaces on the back of the wings, which mm -hmm. when you lower them, they give you more lift and they allow you to fly uh, more slowly than otherwise would be the case. And you typically use the flaps on uh, takeoff and landing, mm -hmm. where you're at a relatively low speed, but you want to have lift. So here's a guy who knows what the flaps do, and he even knows the 15 degree setting is a very good setting um, for departing the airplane. And the third thing he says is, I want the gear down. Okay, a commercial airliner never flies with gear down. When you take off, you get the gear up within seconds. And here's a guy saying, well, gear down. These three instructions are designed for a guy, um, or let's say they're given by a guy who wants the airplane to fly slowly um, at a speed which is convenient uh, for a jump. And this sounds like a guy who has done jumps before and has sufficient knowledge to configure the plane for a jump or for an, for an airdrop of cargo, obviously. Right. Now, the 10,000 feet... He, uh, I'll give you, if you like, this is my um, view as a pilot. Mm -hmm. uh, 10,000 feet would constrain the airplane to a particular corridor. Uh, if, let's say, this uh, man had sufficient aeronautical knowledge to be able to configure the airplane, then you can also say he's familiar with terrain, he's familiar with the Pacific Northwest, he knows about the elevations of terrain in that area. So he would know that uh, as you're flying southwards from Seattle towards Oregon and further south, you have on your uh, starboard side, the Western Cascades, which are relatively low 
uh, mountains. But more importantly, on your port or your left hand side, you've got the high cascades like uh, Mount Hood, Mount Jefferson, and the Three Sisters, of which the highest is Mount Hood, and that goes up to a low over 11,000 feet. Mm -hmm. Now, if he says 10,000 feet, he's telling them, well, you have to stay clear of the high cascades. And the only way you can do that is to fly Victor 23. So I think that um, by giving a very simple instruction, he was setting the flight path for them without giving it away. That's what he wanted to do. Yeah, that makes sense. Like not necessarily saying fly Victor 23, but you give every every other thing to where that's really the only possibility you force them into making that decision. So you don't have to say it. That's correct. Because you imagine if he had said, I want you to fly Victor 23, obviously law enforcement is going to have people stationed all the way down that corridor. There's going to be yeah. guys at Portland. There's going to be guys at Salem, Oregon. There's going to be guys at Eugene. There's going to be guys at Medford, Oregon, mm -hmm. everywhere under the flight path. They're going to have, uh, local law enforcement, if not the FBI, they're going to have the sheriff's office, uh, people watching for the airplane to pass over and ready to uh, um, go into action. But since he doesn't say Victor 23, when the airplane takes off, and nobody in the FBI knows where it's going to go. The only people who know are the flight crew and um, the air traffic control. So there's no way FBI can station people under the flight path. Right. Or maybe they could have done, but perhaps they were not sure that the airplane would even follow that flight path. So let's say the hijacker, at least he minimized the risk that he would have law enforcement waiting for him on the ground. Right. They could not be sure uh, what path he would follow and they could not be sure when and where he would jump. So again, he's minimizing his risk factors. Yeah, as he's done a lot uh, throughout, you know, what we've talked about here. Now, what time of, an, is this, this is nighttime now? What what time is this when this is going yeah. on? Yeah, this is already night. Okay. The so, uh, airplane uh, takes off from Seattle at 7.36 uh, p.m. Pacific Standard Time, which is night. Mm -hmm. um, in a November. Now, so it's dark. Do you think he was able to pretty much tell? I mean, obviously, I I have no background in in aviation. I've never parachuted or or anything like that. So mm -hmm. I don't know as far as looking, and especially at nighttime, I got to imagine it's harder. Uh, did did you think he had a specific spot that he knew this is where I'm going to jump, or you know, roundabout? I mean, because then he comes in. Okay, when you do jump, if you make it, where do you go then? Is there a vehicle? Do you have a vehicle planted or a boat or some something in the area to help, you know, get you out of Dodge? Yeah. Where do you think his plans was at that particular time? Well, this is really one of the most difficult aspects of the case to, to form a view on, whether he had a plan for a specific point. Um <clears throat> There's really no evidence that he had any form of accomplice uh, on the ground. There's no evidence that he had a vehicle on, on the ground or a boat or, or an airplane or any kind of other transport. Um, that's not to say he did not, but no evidence ever came to light. There was never um, an abandoned vehicle or an abandoned boat or airplane. Um, there was never anything that the FBI could pick up that said, uh, this is what he had planned. Right. And I would think, I'm, I'm kind of putting myself in the mind of the hijacker a little bit. Um, he has some uncertainties. Um, he does not know um, how long it will take to reach 10,000 feet. Uh, he does not know how long it will take to get the air stair down. And if he does get it down successfully, he does not uh, know if it will be uh, uh, stable in flight. That's to say, although he knows this can be done, let's suppose he knows it can be done. He himself 
we can say almost certainly has never done it himself. Right. But what he must surely know is that between Seattle and, and Portland, there's a lot of very um, rugged and mountainous terrain. Right. And it would not be smart to jump uh, over that terrain, especially since it's very sparsely populated. There are very few towns. And if you could even see the lights of those towns uh, through the clouds, and don't forget we're above the clouds here. Right. Um, it would be, I think, a very difficult thing to uh, be able to pinpoint a town and go sufficiently close to it to land on on flat ground and not land in, in the woods. Mm -hmm. So putting myself in his shoes, I would say, well, I am much more comfortable if I wait until Portland at least, because I will surely see the lights of Portland, even through the clouds. Portland was a big city even then. Mm -hmm. You would certainly see the lights through the clouds. And once I'm over Portland, I'm over the Willamette Valley, which is flat. So anywhere over the Willamette Valley, it's going to be flat for the next 100 miles. I would say that, um, and here I'm going very much against the FBI's narrative, uh, which, as you probably know, they believed he jumped over the, over the forest uh, mm -hmm. uh, somewhere near the Lewis River. I don't believe that at all. And I don't believe that could ever have been his plan. It doesn't make sense as a plan. If you had done that amount of planning to where you can uh, successfully uh, pull off the, the, the ransom, uh, minimize the number of people who know about it, minimize the number of people who see you, minimize the amount of information that you have to, to give to get the flight going where you want it to be, uh, it doesn't seem to me you're going to do something stupid like jump out over a forest. Yeah, like shortchange yourself on the most important and end of the plan. Like that's that's essentially your last part. Short of stay out of being incarcerated for it, like that's the last phase of the plan is, you know, the getaway. You've already pulled off the heist. You've already done everything very meticulously to that point. So yeah. I, I like you, I don't see him saying, okay, well, at this point, let's just jump and hope for the best. That doesn't seem like his MO uh, to this point, not at all. Yeah, it didn't, that narrative, the FBI's narrative just never made sense to me. Um, and if we have time, we can talk a little bit about why I think the narrative is wrong and the mistakes that they absolutely uh, yeah. made. But it's it does seem to me that the getaway had to be subject to the at least an equal amount of planning to the uh, to the heist itself. You would think so, so. I think, yeah, there's a lot of evidence that favors the 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 Willamette uh, Valley as a, a place to land. And by that time, you have got uh, landmarks. You've got big cities, which you're going to see quite clearly. You'll see a kind, some kind of glow. Mm -hmm. For sure, you'll see Portland. And if you're still on board when they get down to Salem, Oregon, you will see the lights of Salem as well. And if you were still on board at Eugene, which I think would be getting a little bit unlikely, but just for theoretically, if you saw the lights of Eugene, you know, you're still in the Willamette. Yeah. No, that, that makes sense. And yeah, we have time. If you want to get into about some of those narratives, feel free, go ahead. Okay. Well, I, I think that um, the FBI's narrative is, is, is very interesting. Because in a way, they did not construct that narrative themselves. They essentially bought into it from Northwest Airlines. And um, there's a certain logic to that, because the FBI, obviously, they are law enforcement people. They don't know anything about aviation. Right. And this is clearly a case where they need guys who know aviation. So they turned to Northwest. They said, well, where do you think he jumped and where do you think he landed? And that whole um, if you like that intellectual exercise and practical exercise, went to a very senior guy uh, in Minneapolis. His title was uh, Director of Flight Operations Technical, and he was a very famous aviator and a very well-experienced pilot. I don't want to mention his name because, um, first of all, his name, although he's deceased, he passed away about 20 years ago. Um, his name is redacted 
from all the FBI files, which for me is very strange because normally the FBI, once a person's passed away, they feel it's okay to, to re release that name, but they have never done so even up to today. Um, so it seems to me that they feel that that person's participation in the case is not something that they want to be in the public domain. Huh. Um, but in any way, um, this uh, gentleman was given the task of uh, advising the FBI, or maybe he wasn't given it, but let's say he took it upon himself to say, okay, I can help you. Um, I've studied the uh, flight data recorder. I've studied the communications with air traffic control, and I've studied the private communications with Northwest Airlines, which they made on another frequency. And uh, putting all of that information together, he gave a time and a place where he thought the hijacker had left the airplane. And that was uh, a small place called Highland, Washington, which is almost just a junction of two roads. And he, he came up with the time of 8.11 p.m. Pacific Standard Time. He said, this is where the guy jumped, plus or minus a minute, plus or minus, let's say, um, three nautical miles. Right. And he said, okay, given the wind at that time, let's say from the southwest, about 20 knots, he had to drift towards the northeast, and uh, depending on when, whether he pulled uh, the chute uh, quickly or whether he did a free fall and pulled it late, this is where he had to land. And he presented that in a three-page memo to the FBI, and that was on January the 9th, 1972. So uh, barely two months after the hijacking, he right. came up with this narrative. And the FBI essentially bought into that narrative and they went, and as history has recorded, they went and searched in that area that he had drawn out on, on the ground, an area about six miles northeast by about three miles east-west. And they engaged the US Army and uh, the Sheriff's Departments and who knows who else. And again, as history records, they came up with nothing. Yeah, literally nothing. So, um, well, later on, they developed the narrative was that no, that was the right search area. But obviously, with all that blueberry and blackberry brush, all it means is we we couldn't hack our way through it. He's in there somewhere. And that became the narrative which they maintained for the next 45 years. I think they were never able to admit that they might have searched in the wrong area. Mm -hmm. uh, now, and yet that is what I believe today. And I've heard this theory and was it was kind of interesting at first. The only reason I really don't buy into it is I don't want to jump ahead, but some of the money was located years after the fact, I believe by a family that was, was in the area. But the theory was that the flight crew that stayed on fabricated this whole thing. Hmm. There was never a DB Cooper. There was never anybody with a bomb. There was never, you know, any of that. They made all this up mm -hmm. and done that to say that this person did all this and, and they kept the money, which <laughs> is in theory, a very good idea. It seems like it would make a great movie. Um, the only problem with that is once that money is being counted, you, you can't spend it. Um, and then, like I said, not to, not to jump ahead, but there was some collected, later on down the line. Have you heard that theory? Uh, yes, Wade, I've heard that. I, I would not give that the uh, dignity of uh, calling it a theory. Yeah. <laughs> um, but yeah, long story short, yes, uh, some of the money, about $5,900, was found on the banks of the Columbia River on a place called Tina Bar. That's a very well-documented story. It was found by a young boy of eight years old in February of 1980. That's correct. And there's no question it was part of the money. The serial numbers matched up every one of them. Mm -hmm. um, we can come back. I think we should probably discuss that more. Yeah. But to just briefly to address the 
idea that the flight crew could have participated in this. Um, essentially, there's um, enormous amounts of evidence um, that this was a um, a real hijack done by a party who was unknown to uh, any of the crew. Um, there are witness statements. Um, the three cabin crew all saw him physically close up. Uh, five or six passengers saw him, not knowing he were at that time that he was a hijacker, right. but saw him with uh, at a sufficient distance to be able later to give statements about what he looked like. And in addition, two ground staff at Portland, the ticket agent who sold the ticket and a, a gate agent remembered him and gave descriptions of him. And all these uh, descriptions essentially are pretty much consistent. Uh, there's no evidence whatsoever that the flight crew had any involvement. So this is simply a story which um, it lacks any kind of support whatsoever. Yeah, it lacks the, the credibility. Like you said, once you start piecing together, you know, the ticket receipt and and all sorts of other things. And obviously people, like you said, seeing him, not necessarily knowing at the time that, you know, what was going on because they were oblivious to, you know, the facts that was taking place at that time. Them seeing him definitely, you know, lends credence to, you know, it was him. And like you said, he has a very distinctive description. Was it like a a black suit and, you know, tie, everybody kind of describes them the same. If you Google DB Cooper, that'll probably be one of the first, uh, pictures that pops up. Uh, yes. Uh, his, his description, his appearance was pretty much consistently described. And I think it's maybe worthwhile if we spend a couple of minutes just talking about what he looked like. Yeah. Uh, because, um, that gives you some idea about how many, um, candidates could possibly have been this man. Mm -hmm. And I think the thing that sticks in my mind is that he was a very ordinary looking guy. He was a guy that you really could pass on the street and never remember. Yeah. He was, okay, his height, five foot 10 to six foot one. Most people were agreed on that. Slightly tall guy, taller than the average. A relatively thin guy, uh, about 175, 180 pounds, which is quite uh, thin for a guy of that height. Mm -hmm. uh, a white guy, Caucasian guy, by most accounts. There is a minority view that would have him to be a Hispanic or a perhaps better, we would say, uh, somewhat Latin. But maybe only in the same way you would say Robert De Niro has a Latin look. In other words, people who saw him, they saw him as a white guy. Right. And um, if you look at the census of the USA of the year 1970, um, there were approximately one million Caucasian guys of five foot ten to six foot one. So uh, if that's all you had to go on. Um, it's a pretty wide suspect. This, man. <laughs> yeah, it comes up to these people who come up with a suspect, you know, which could be their brother, their cousin, their husband, their late husband, their classmate. And they go, yeah, he's he's the guy, you know, he fits, you know, he he checks the boxes. And then you ask the question, well, do you have any evidence this guy was in Portland, Oregon on November 24th, 1971. Well, no, I don't. Okay, so his chance of being the guy is one in a million. Yeah, literally. Okay, then you can say, well, well, okay, the guy, let's suppose your suspect, the person insists, well, okay, but this guy, he had parachuting experience. Okay, right there, that narrows it down. I agree. Um, in the USA, in the year 1971, I would say there were approximately 100,000 veterans of the U.S. Airborne, guys who had been in the Airborne in the Second World War, 
and um, a very much smaller number who had been uh, uh, airborne in the Korean War because Korean didn't did not use paratroopers to any significant extent. And in Vietnam, there were no parachute, there were no paratroopers. In Vietnam, you did your insertions with helicopter. So uh, people that had parachuting experience in the military, approximately 90,000 vets that had survived the, birth, the, the, the Second World War and Korea. And in addition to that, you can add about 15,000 sport parachutists who belong to skydiving clubs. So you have a total of about 100,000 people that uh, have parachuting experience. Okay, again, the same odd supply. If you produce a suspect and you say, okay, uh, he's done skydiving. Was he in Portland, Oregon on that day? I don't know. Okay, your chances are one in 100,000 now. Mm -hmm. I'm not gonna pursue that suspect on that basis. Yeah. If I'm law enforcement, I will not do that. The minimum I will need, and this is what the retired FBI agent said to me. He said, I'm not going to accept the suspect just because you think he's the right age, the right size, and he's he's done jumps. I need more than that. I need a hotel bill from Portland of that day. I need a rental car receipt. I need a bus ticket. I need something. If you don't have that, then please have a good day and leave my office. Right. <laughs> so um so there's his there's his appearance he's a, a slightly taller than the average uh white guy uh probably around 40 to 50 uh wearing a dark suit which means nothing because anybody can wear a dark suit wearing a tie anybody can wear a tie <clears throat> and that's all you know about him did there was were he only... wearing glasses As some pictures he has on a set of glasses and some he don't yeah, he had uh, uh, shades, uh, uh, dark shades, sunshades, sunglasses, which he put on very early in the flight, and he kept on those glasses until he left the airplane. Wow. So he was he was seen for probably only a few minutes without the sunglasses, uh, and that would have been in the first instance by the second stewardess, the one who received the note. And obviously, that would be a very indelible image that would have stayed in her mind. Right. And probably for a very short time by the junior stewardess who later sat beside him, um, she might have seen him for some time without those sunglasses. But as she said later on, she saw him mostly in profile uh, because he was sitting beside her and he, he was whispering into her ear. So she had to put her ear to him. And she was never really seeing him face on. Mm hmm. Wow. So, um, long story short, yeah, pretty much uh, ninety-nine percent of the uh, of his visibility to witnesses was with these wraparound shades. Uh, hmm. So his eyes were not visible. Well, but so like you said, that doesn't that doesn't necessarily give you any sort of big clue to go after. There's still a very wide suspect range and like you said even if you can narrow it down to jumping experience there's still a hundred thousand people that's uh not something that you're going to be able to sift through very quickly yeah, uh, yeah. To, other than the fact of who was db cooper and we'll probably get into that next i think the biggest question is did he live because after the jump like we've kind of discussed they didn't find a boat. They didn't find a truck or vehicle or, or you know, doom buggy, w w mm -hmm. any sort of thing hidden out there in that area. But the thing is, if he didn't make it, then you should. I would think if I had a car set up and I misjudged my jump or landing or whatever, and I didn't make it to say I landed in the river and drowned or, or whatever was close by, mm -hmm. or did hit a tree, you're going to find whatever I had put in place to get me out of there. I don't think he was planning on getting out of there on foot. Um, as we've discussed of his planning throughout this whole thing. So I think the fact that they didn't find a vehicle lends credence to the fact that he got away. Um, obviously on the way down, I'm not sure. Obviously some of the money had to either come out or get lost, but you know, he could have lost all of it on the way down. That's that's, you know, up for, debate yeah. interpretation obviously we know five thousand of it got lost because it was found 
Do yeah. you think that whomever this was, and we'll get into suspects here in a second, but do you think that he made the successful jump and got away? Okay, wait, I think there are two parts to this story. I think, um, firstly, is um, uh, making a successful jump. In other words, getting under the canopy. And uh, there are people who think that he uh, did not pull the ripcord and therefore uh, uh, plunged to his death. And in fact, that uh, remained one of the uh, favorite narratives of the uh, FBI right up until 2016 when they suspended the case. Um, two very senior FBI agents uh, to the end of their days insisted that he was what they call a no pull. In other words, he never pulled the ripcord. And I suppose that makes them feel good because they feel, well, okay, we never found his body, but that's because he's in the blackberry bushes. But, you know, as far as we're concerned, he's dead. So uh, if you like, it's a kind of, um, uh, something that they wanted to believe. Mm -hmm. uh, to, uh, if you like, make up in some way for not solving the case. Yeah, uh, I mean, let me address that they, first part. Yeah, they don't want to look incompetent at the end of the day. They don't want to make it seem like this guy was able to pull all this off and get away with it. So, yes. Yeah, so the no pull theory remained one of the uh, part of the narrative of the FBI for a long time, even up to the suspension of the case. Let me address that part first. Um, like I said, I've done some parachute jumps myself. I'm not by any means experienced, but um, I've done parachute jumps, both static line and free fall. And uh, I've also read the FBI files where they interview uh, experienced parachutists and people who know parachuting very well. And I would say the the view of any uh, person who's done jumping is that um, you leave an airplane with um, a Navy backpack chute, which is basically an emergency survival chute. It's designed to open very, very easily and to open quickly and bring you down. It's not a skydiving chute. It's not a sport chute. It's a chute designed to save your life. And uh, I am convinced that with such a shoot, you're going to get under canopy. You will, will find the ripcord, the ripcord. You will pull it. You'll get under canopy, and you will make it down to the ground. So I think that uh, uh, he got under canopy. I, I really have no doubt about that. I don't think that's debatable. Now the second point is: okay, did he survive the landing? Now that is a separate story. If he arrives on ground, he is going to survive. Um, even if you land in a tree um, or if you land on a rocks, uh, you land on uneven ground. And as I said earlier, I think he would avoid it situations where that was likely to be a risk. Right. Um, he no, would not have. Uh, he would not have intentionally jumped over land that he knew to be inhospitable. Now, if you follow my logic and you say, well, he is a planner, he's looking for flat land uh, to, to make the landing, then if he lands on, uh, on ground, he will survive. Landing on ground, I've done it myself. Uh, you take the shock uh, on your ankles, on your knees, you roll, and you get up, you walk away. There's nothing about landing under a Navy backpack chute which is going to cause you any kind of grief. Now, the only possibility where he might not have survived would be a water landing. Uh, and obviously, this is a possibility. He mm -hmm. could have made a water landing. And we can come back to this in a moment because obviously the presence of the money which was found on the Columbia is uh, it points towards a water landing. Right. If some of the money arrives in the water, it arrives on the bank of the Columbia, how could it get there except by the Columbia? 
right. which means it fell in the Columbia or it fell in some tributary of the Columbia. And if it fell, well, okay, the hijacker could have arrived at the same time with the money. Again, you've got to kind of work with the probabilities. Where is he likely to lose the money? Um, from the air stair itself, could he lose some of the money or all of the money from the air stair? Okay, it's possible. But the air stair is a very stable environment. There's very little wind blast on the air stair that was demonstrated by the um, Boeing tests and later on by the, um, we, I forgot to mention this, but uh, the FBI and uh, Northwest did a, a replica of the flight, which they called the sled test flight, where they tried to replicate the hijacker's jump. And they did that in, in January, 1972. But even on that, on the replica flight, they found that the environment of the Esther was uh, very benign. So the, the air stair itself is not a place where you're likely to lose the money. If you've secured it to yourself in some way, you're not going to lose it from the air stair. Right. Now, where else can you lose it? You can lose it when the parachute opens. You are going to be subject to a G-force. This is a Navy chute. It's a military chute. It has a hard opening. It's not like a sport chute, which has a general opening. The Navy chute, they don't care if you have a shock. You know, they want to save your life. Right. So it opens with a force to about two, three Gs. That is not a lot of Gs. Um, it's for a fraction of a second. If your money is not well secured, that is a point where you can lose it. In other words, you could, horrified, you could watch the money disappear out into space <laughs> below your feet. It arrives in the Columbia or wherever, and you land safely in Portland or Vancouver or somewhere else <laughs> without the money. That's possible, yeah, we cannot rule that out. And the third possibility is that the hijacker and the money arrive together in the water. And this is November, the water is uh, probably uh, at a temperature below uh, freezing. Yeah. And if you uh, have the misfortune to land in the middle of a substantial river, uh, you had better be a good swimmer uh, and uh, be able to get to shore. Yeah. So there are scenarios, I cannot rule it out, where the hijacker perishes. And for me, the only real scenario where that happens is a water landing, and specifically a water landing um, far from the shore. Uh, where the flight... Uh, 305 crossed over the Columbia. The Columbia is a mile wide. Uh, if you land in the middle of the Columbia, um, near the interstate bridge, um, you have a half a mile in freezing water. Um, I don't know. I, I, I know I would not make it. No, no, I don't think I would either. And I so think that's I, just... another thing to go along with that. I don't, I don't mean to cut you off, but like, so the, the kids that found the five grand. And as you say, that yeah. washed up on the bank. So obviously it was in the river or somewhere, some place close to get there. One would yeah. think that it's possible that if he did make a water landing, all the money got swept up into the river, you know, God knows where it could have wound up. That piece just wound up there. I think a lot of people do maybe subscribe to the theory that he perished just because that was found, which would lead you to believe that he was in the water, which would make a body recovery extremely, probably more difficult, if at all. And the fact that no other money ever turned up, at least to my knowledge, from this. So even if he did make it, even if he did, you know, if some fell out in flight or the way this guy thinks, it could have been possible if he landed somewhere close, he could have just threw some out, you know, who knows. And if he did get away, what did he do with the money? So that's, that's kind of the thing is if you don't, if you put all this planning into stealing all this money, obviously your goal is to kick back. And I don't know if that's even enough money to retire on in those days. Maybe it was, but you know, spend it, but it never did because it never yeah. did open circulation. Uh, okay. Well, I would say certainly the money showing up um, on the river bank does point to a water landing in, in my mind. 
it doesn't necessarily point to the hijacker's demise. Right. But it points to his losing the money, uh, some of the money. And I, I think it's entirely possible that he would have lost all of the money. It's kind of difficult for me to imagine that three bundles of 20s uh, get separated on their own mm -hmm. and yet stay uh, attached to each other. And the remaining 194,000 disappear somewhere else. Um, I did not really write about this in my book because I felt there was so little evidence to go on. But it seems to me there must have been some mechanism to keep these three bundles of bills together, together in yeah. one place for sufficient time uh, for them to get from wherever they landed to Tina Bar. And don't forget that's over a period of uh, eight summers and nine winters. So they got plenty of time yeah. to get to where they were found. They could have uh, landed 100 miles away for all we know, because uh, if they... <laughs> I just uh, just a couple of days ago, I wrote a, a, a blog post on my author's blog. And uh, the reason I wrote that blog post is because I just came across an interview uh, by the first officer of Flight 305, who is still alive. And he talked to the British uh, BBC World Service in 2015, which is only seven years ago. He's in his 70s now. And he said, and this is the first time that I ever, ever heard a witness say this. He said, as many other people have said, I think the hijacker perished. Okay, that's his personal view. He's entitled to that view. But then he went on to say, he perished in southern Washington or northern Oregon. And I thought, what? Did I just hear Northern Oregon? Because I have never heard this from any witness or any principal to the case in all the time I've been studying it and writing about it. Here's the first officer who was on that flight. He was part of the whole drama. And he said, Northern Oregon. I mean, he's allowing Northern Oregon to enter the story. It seems to me over a period of 40 plus years, he's somehow come to feel you know, this Washington narrative, you know, I, I'm not even sure about that anymore. Or Orington is starting to look more like it could be. He's he's saying it could have been Oregon. Right. And if it could have been Oregon, well, then, okay. Then we're talking about the Willamette Valley. We're talking about the Willamette River or some of the uh, tributaries of the Willamette, like uh, the Malala, the Pudding, the North Santiam the South Santiam, the Mackenzie River, any of those rivers lead into the Willamette and the Willamette leads into the Columbia. So just for fun, I said, well, let's suppose, for example, that the hijacker jumps over Eugene, Oregon, where the airplane would have been at 9.30 Pacific Standard Time on that night. And he would see the lights of Eugene, Oregon. And by misfortune, he lands in the Willamette which I think is not a very wide river at that point in Oregon, or he loses the money and the money lands in the Willamette. Now the money has got um, over eight years to arrive at Tina Bar. Right. How could it do that? Well, I think it has to stay in the bank bag. Yeah. Because wow. if these three bundles come out of the bank bag at that point, they're not going to stay together attached to each other. They're going to work over, apart. over eight years. I mean, those three bundles, yeah, they could arrive at, at Tina Bar over eight years, but they won't be stuck to each other. Right. You would find three <laughs> bundles maybe 100 yards apart from each other, but you won't find them all in the same spot where that boy dug them up. There are scenarios where he perishes, and those scenarios, I think, are linked to a water landing. Mm -hmm. uh, that is one of the possibilities. But there are others in which um, he survives. So I, I think the best answer I can give is there's no evidence either way that he survived or perished. Right. And really, it's a matter of individual uh, belief as 
uh, as to what you think. Right. Now, I think other than other than him living and not living, I think one of the things that too that pointed to possibly something happening was the point that I made as far as like none of the other money being recorded in circulation. So you would think if he pulled it off, if he lived, he'd done it maybe just to see if he could, in a sense, because if he knows it was marked, obviously mm -hmm. if you that once it gets into circulation, they're going to see, you know, where it was put in at, and that'll kind of narrow the field down. It won't necessarily tell them exactly who you are, but it'll at least give them a, a start mm -hmm. to try to locate you. What's your theory as far as like none of the other money, neither being recovered, which I think is key also, or even being put into circulation? Okay, that, that's a difficult uh, question to address. Um, there has been quite extensive debates on internet forums uh, as to uh, whether the money could have entered circulation or not. It is, of course, a fact that no other money uh, was ever uh, recovered. As to whether it could have been circulated and simply never picked up, it is an issue that has been debated, and there have even been people who have, uh, uh, with treasury experience, people in the banking business, who have expressed views on that. I don't have any specific expertise to say what's the probability of the money uh, having been circulated or not. There are different views on that subject. I don't feel really very qualified to address that. Right. I think the only th thing that I could say that um, seems to me to fit with the evidence is that uh, the money found on the bank was three bundles uh, of about $2,000 each. And those bundles had somehow stayed in proximity to each other. Mm -hmm. They had not separated. And that, for me, is at least circumstantial evidence that probably all of the money got lost. Um, and the 6,000 that showed up on Tina Bar were just uh, a random event of the river that uh, these three bundles um, got disgorged on the bank. Mm -hmm. And quite possibly, I mean, I find it quite easy to imagine that the rest of the money, probably still in the bag, made its way down to the Pacific and uh, was lost forever. Yeah, that was quite so, possible. Yeah, it's it's nothing I can give you evidence for. Right. I can only say that it's a scenario that somehow seems coherent to me, that all the money was lost and therefore the hijacker never had an opportunity to spend it, spend it. whether he lived or, or, or died. Now, this spawned off a couple of uh, copycat hijackings, if you will. Um, I don't think they were nowhere near to the level of success as this one and one would think well if you got away with it one time but you lost the money and you know what would stop you from trying it again and maybe yeah. come up with a different way of keeping the money mm -hmm. but i think at the end of the day one of the biggest questions is who was db cooper now with that there's been quite a few suspects you know named throughout the years you know, if you had to put your stamp of approval on it, do you think it is one that we've heard, you know, names before, or do you think it's someone that maybe possibly haven't been talked about? I know Richard well, McCoy was a, a big name, but there, there's you, you always have, when you have a name, it seems like you get plenty of evidence to say, yeah, it is, or no, it isn't. So it makes it hard. Okay. Well, um, wait, I'm going to duck this question. Uh, which I told you I would. Yeah. Um, and I, it's for this reason. Uh, when I started out to write about uh, the case of D.B. Cooper and Flight 305, um, I could see already 
that there was an enormous amount of debate centering, centering around individuals. And obviously some of those individuals were copycat hijackers. Uh, and uh, all of those individuals have been proposed to have been the hijacker of Flight 305, as well as many others uh, proposed by their friends, their family, their relatives, colleagues, and so on, as well as quite a few people who have confessed uh, to the crime. I um, did want, I did not want to be part of that debate. Um, I felt I could not add anything to that. In order to add anything, I would have to research all, every one of those individuals. I would have to read books about them. I would have to form opinions uh, as to uh, uh, where they were uh, on the night of uh, Flight 305. Mm -hmm. And I think the most important thing I should say is that every one of the suspects or individuals who have been discussed in the public domain, not one of them, not one of them, is there any evidence whatsoever to place that person in Portland, Oregon on November 24th, 1971. Really? And absent such evidence, from my point of view, this is basically a narrative chasing data. Right. This is a situation where somebody has chosen an individual and wants to find data that support that narrative. Uh, the FBI agent, the retired agent, whom I spoke to on the telephone a couple of months ago, uh, he said, not to me, in fact, but to another uh, uh, researcher, one thing that uh, I thought was a piece of wisdom. He said, if you really want to uh, contribute to our understanding of this case, don't start with a suspect. Mm -hmm. He said, start with data and see where the data lead you. No, yeah, that makes and makes perfect that's, sense. That's essentially what I uh, have always done and what I'm still doing. I am not um, even thinking about suspects and confessions. Yeah. So I, I honestly wait. I cannot express any view. And a lot of people have asked me to come down on one side or another about one suspect they like. Um, and I've said, no, I cannot do that. Um, I simply don't have the data to back you up. There was one guy who invited me. As you know, I live in Europe. And he said, uh, Bob, I'd like you to come to the USA. I said, what for? He said, I got a piece of evidence that I want to show you, which will blow this case wide open. And it will back up my suspect 100% or 1,000%. I said, OK, um, it's nice of you to invite me. And he said, I'm even willing to pay your hotel bills. I said, thank you, uh, but um, I have to decline. Um, I've uh, presented myself to my publisher. And more importantly, I present myself to my readers as a guy who works with data. Mm -hmm. OK, I do not endorse any suspect in the absence of evidence. And perhaps even with evidence, I would say, well, it's not my job anyway. I'm a writer. I'm not law enforcement. If you have evidence of a suspect, you should go to the FBI. Mm -hmm. You want somebody to come and see your evidence? Call this guy. Call the FBI agent. Uh, I'll, I'll give you a telephone number. I'll give you his address. Call him. He's the guy who should close the case, not me. Right. I don't want to be part of this uh, narrative. Okay, so wait, I'm going to try and answer your question a different way. I'm not going to answer you. Who was D.B. Cooper? What I will try to say is um, what was the prior 
history of the hijacker of Flight 305? What was his backstory? That's a fair. That's a fair question. There, I like that. Okay, and this is essentially. I'll, I'll paraphrase what I wrote in the closing chapter of my book. Um, I believe that the hijacker of Flight 305 was a guy who had served in the U.S. military. I think there's plenty of evidence relating to his uh, behavior, his planning, uh, things that he said, uh, his... Uh, familiarity with the parachutes, uh, the, the choice he made of the parachutes that he had that say he had been in the military. Mm -hmm. Which branch of the military? I would say not the U.S. Army. He had not been a paratrooper. He had not been airborne. He had not been an airborne soldier. Why not? Because he had more knowledge than an airborne soldier would possess the knowledge of specifying the altitude to fly the uh, airplane configuration uh, an airborne soldier doesn't need that knowledge yeah they just... who needs that knowledge they, they jump they jump they probably couldn't tell you even what a flap is and what's the airspeed who is the kind of person who has that knowledge it's somebody who handles airdrops drops of people or drops of cargo and these people you find in the u.s air force mm -hmm. i believe that the hijacker of 305 was ex-us air force and i believe specifically that his occupation in the u.s air force whether he had the title or not it would have been loadmaster now the loadmaster is a designation which was created by the Douglas uh, Airplane Company in the early 1950s. And they used it as a specific crew destination for the Douglas C-124 uh, Globemaster, which was a big cargo airplane used by the US Air Force. And um, because of the complexities or the increasing complexities at that time of, of airdrops and the uh, relatively advanced uh, equipment you had to secure cargo, to secure uh, a weight and balance of the airplane, and to make a safe drop of whatever you wanted to drop. You needed a specialized person aboard the airplane. And Douglas introduced this um, occupation, which they called the Douglas Loadmaster. And the US Air Force liked that. And eventually, they created the term Loadmaster as a US Air Force uh, occupation and they gave it a code. So after the Korean War, um, it became uh, a US Air Force designation. So I think that the hijacker had been a loadmaster. It's it's the right amount of expertise. It's neither too little nor too much to match with what we know that he knew. Right. Uh, the next question is, when and where did he serve? From his age, I would say, and plus if, if we um, think that he might have been a loadmaster, then we need to put him in the Korean War. He's uh, too old to be Vietnam, mm -hmm. way too old. He's pretty much too young to be World War II. You yeah. can make a case for it, but he's kind of young. I mean, guys, ex World War II, they're going to be sixty plus. Mm -hmm. So, uh, Korean War is his era. That's where I think a, a big chunk of his service was done, and this fits with the C one twenty four because the C one twenty four was introduced specifically for the Korean War, and that's where it had most of its. Uh, combat experience and the C-124 was used uh, not only to ferry uh, people and, and cargo from the uh, uh, Pacific uh, uh, coast to uh, to Korea or to Japan, but also uh, flew in combat uh, in, in the Korean war zone. So I think it's highly probable that the hijacker of Flight 305 had 
experience in a C-124 squadron. And I think the last thing I would venture, the last thing I would advance as a hypothesis would be that not only had he been in a C-124 squadron, but he had been based at some point in one of those squadrons that was stationed in the Pacific Northwest, either McCord Air Force Base itself or Malarson, Malarson Air Force Base in Washington. Both of those bases hosted C-124s at one time or another. And from that, he would have his knowledge of the airspace of the Pacific Northwest. Plus, he would uh, recognize McCord Air Force Base from the air and know where it was in, in reference to the airplane, which again is, is documented in the FBI files. Mm -hmm. So that's my short story of where he had been. He didn't board Flight 305 from nowhere. He had a life story. And those are the elements of the life story that I'm prepared to argue but that's the kind of guy he had been. And I threw down this challenge, if you like, to the FBI and to law enforcement and to anybody who wants to follow the case. I said, look, if you like my story, you can go to the National Personnel Records Center in St. Louis, Missouri, and you can look up, you can find the records, the service histories of all the guys there were loadmasters on C-124s. Those records are all in the public domain now. 70 years have passed. Any private citizen can ask for them. Any law enforcement officer obviously can get them. And there's not that many. The Douglas Airplane Company made about 450 C-124s. Most of them had only one loadmaster. Maybe a few of them had two. But we're talking about maybe 500 guys total. That's when you consider the FBI looked at a thousand suspects over the course of 45 years and found nothing with all these leads from the public. It seems to me not a complete waste of effort to follow a, a, a if you like, a logical and uh, documented hypothesis to look up another 500 guys. And if among these records, you should find a guy that was born in Washington or Oregon or Idaho or anywhere around there, you might, quite possibly the guy is deceased by now, but you might want to have, have to his. Just out of curiosity, I mean, do you, have you pursued any of this yourself or you're just more or less comfortable with putting the data out there? Well, <clears throat> um, I did uh, pursue one particular individual who uh, met all these criteria. Um, but I have to say that I do not claim that this guy was the hijacker. I simply liked his story because his story seemed to me the kind of, the kind of story that the hijacker had. Mm -hmm. This guy was born in a small town in Oregon um, around 1950. He enlisted in the U.S. Air Force. Um, we don't, I don't have a service history. I did put in a request, the S-140 form to St. Louis, Missouri, to ask for it, just for fun. Uh, they haven't replied. It's been more than a year. Uh, <laughs> Not holding my breath. Yeah. But okay, this guy um, later on um, was um, in college, in um, a state college in, in Oregon. And uh, it seems he told his friends, or he told some of his friends, he wasn't very much of a sociable guy, but he told some of his classmates that he had been a, a loadmaster in the Korean War. And the reason this guy came to my attention was because um, many years later, one of his classmates wrote to the FBI, he'd seen the sketches in the newspapers, and he said, 
and he wrote a very uh, uh, coherent letter, uh, nicely typed and nicely explained, saying, you know, I think this classmate that I was in college with back in uh, 1960 or so, I think he's your guy. I mean, he's the spitting image. The sketches I saw in the papers, it's him. He wrote to the FBI. The FBI round filed the letter. They did nothing about it. But I was sufficiently interested to um, study this letter. And of course, the names are all redacted. Mm -hmm. But since they, in those days, they wrote on typewriters and uh, a typewriter has equal spacing of all the letters. So you can work on the number of letters in the guy's name. Right. This this guy, the guy who ratted on the loadmaster, had attached um, uh, some scans or some photocopies from his college yearbook. And of course, the name of the college was also redacted, but it wasn't difficult to work out which college it was. So I got the yearbook off the internet. I looked up all the pictures of the guys. I looked at their names and the number of letters in the name, and I found the guy. And there was his picture. And okay, yeah, in some ways, he looks a little bit like the sketches that have been all over the internet. Not, not that I would, doesn't leap off the page to me, but I could see how his classmate would think, yeah, that's the guy. Okay, I did some research on the guy and I found out his life story. I found out when he got married, when he was born, you know, he was, he had no brothers and sisters. He married his high school sweetheart. After the war, things went wrong. They got divorced. Um, she filed a complaint against him. His mother died. And in 1971, he was kind of all alone. He had no job. He had no family. And then later on in later life, he comes back, he appears again, and he's working in a, a government facility in, in Washington State, a very high-tech facility. And he has a normal life of a government employee in a, in a basically a, a computer, a, a, an IT environment. Mm -hmm. He's a, an ordinary citizen. He goes to church, he plays golf. And about a few years ago, he passed away. Can you I imagine? don't think he's the guy. I'm not saying he's the guy. It's just a story. But the, the irony, though, of that is if it was him, then later yeah. on he goes back and gets a job with the government. <laughs> I mean, that's kind of <laughs> that's uh, I don't know. That's, that's kind of funny to me. Um, what? Well, yeah, in, it's in closing. Do you think DB that's this particular night in question that we've discussed? Do you think he survived the jump? We're not, not counting the money. Maybe the money got lost. Maybe it didn't. My bet is like you said, it probably got lost, but do you think he survived the jump? Well, okay. I, I, I will only say that, um, in my mind, if I kind of, juggle all the data and all the evidence um, that I know about and all the thousands of pages that, of data and reports that I've read. Um, probably the balance in my mind is that he did survive, that he probably lost all of the money and that um, Perhaps in some way he just resumed his life. Mm -hmm. He was perhaps, and if you like now, I'm speaking as a, a writer. I'm speaking simply as a, uh, a guy that likes stories. The story that I like is that he was happy to have lived. He lost the money. He thought better of doing that kind of thing. And somehow he picked up his life again. And I even feel that he might still be alive. And if he is, he's 95 years old. And I'm waiting for him to call <laughs> and tell me, uh, Bob, I, I read your book. 
you were this is what you this is what you got right or this is what you got wrong well you, you never know maybe he might uh get it. i would imagine i would have to think if he's alive you know maybe like you said maybe he's losing the money living through the jump losing the money maybe kind of put things in perspective maybe give him a new lease on life if you will new drive um and then he did pursue to carry on his life because we all know once somebody does one thing be it a robbery or you know you can even bring up things like 9 11 or even things that aren't tragic once it's done the first time things are automatically done to combat that that's why the the people that tried to copycat weren't you know successful so i think he probably even had the foresight to know well they're not going to fall for this all over again. So me retrying to do it six months from now, probably ain't going to be the brightest, you know, thing. And if he did just continue on his life, I, I would assume he's probably got to follow these, these documentaries and these YouTube and these, you know, books and everything. So I'm sure if he's alive, he read your book. I, I, I feel hundred percent. He did. Yeah, I hope so. I hope so. And to be honest, if I had done that stunt, and if I had lost the money but survived, I would never do it again. Yeah. No, I believe that too. Um, tell our audience uh, where they can go to pick up your book um, and is you know all the different avenues nowadays. We got Audible and everything else. I don't know what all platforms it's on, but tell our audience where they can go to find that. Well, okay, the book is only available in hardback. Uh, there is no ebook. There is no uh, soft cover, and. Uh, there's no audiobook as yet. Um, you can either get it from my publisher, uh, Schiffer of Atlan, Pennsylvania, direct. They have a website. You can also obviously get it on Amazon. It's um, just look up the uh, title on Amazon. And uh, you can find it if you like to go to a retailer. You'll find it in uh, your local Barnes and Noble. And you'll find it in uh, Books a Million. Books a Million. All right. Well, we will put a link to that book in our show notes for people that want to go pick that up. And Bob, I want to tell you how much I appreciate you coming on the show today. I really enjoyed this interview. This has just been one of those cases that, you know, is, is always fascinating, which I think anything where that leaves the, you know, that ending impression of you don't know exactly how it happened. I think those are the kind of things that, that fascinates people for years to come, as with this case, you know, look much like kind of like Jimmy Hoffa, like we mentioned you know, mm -hmm. who did it? Where is he? When I think when you find out those things, you get closure and you're able to move on. But if you don't have that closure, these kind of things hang around for mm -hmm. a while. And, you know, I, I really appreciate you coming on to talk about this. Well, thank you, Wade. And also, I appreciate you very much uh, inviting me on the show. I hope I've given you and uh, your audience some material uh, that will interest them and fascinate them. And perhaps even inspire them to get into their SUV and drive up to the Pacific Northwest, where I've uh, given in my book some suggestions about places to look. Yeah. The traces of the hijackers' passage. Yeah, absolutely. Well, hey, ladies and gentlemen, this was Bob Edwards. The name of the book, D.B. Cooper and Flight 305, Re-Examining the Hijacking and the Disappearance. Please go give that a look. Order it. It's a great book. Uh, we'll put the, like I said, the link to that in the show notes for you guys to do that. Are you on any type of social media where people can follow you on there? Uh, yes, Wade. I'm on Twitter. Uh, just look up my name. Uh, I'm on uh, Facebook, uh, LinkedIn. And also for those that uh, really want to take a deep dive into um, uh, my areas of my research that I didn't or couldn't include in the book, uh, if you go to Goodreads, you'll find my blog uh, where um, I'm continually updating new areas of research that uh, uh, I come across and I feel are worth sharing with my readers. So on the Goodreads author page uh, and also on my Amazon uh, author page, you'll find my blog, which gets updated. Oh every few days or so okay good yeah we'll put a link to that as well well bob like i said again one more time i appreciate you coming on the show ladies and gentlemen i am hollywood wade 
that was Bob Edwards. And this was the episode on the always interesting DB Cooper. And that will do it. Bob, we appreciate you stopping by the show, my friend. Thank you, Wade. Good night. God bless. Thank you.